Hello everybody and welcome to the fifth edition of our Innovation Pillar events. The Innovation Pillar events are a cycle of six workshops that take you through all of the key principles and frameworks for building an impactful and sustained and get a sustained program with engagement for your innovation program. My name is Caitlin and for those of you who don't know me, I work with our clients of all different shapes and sizes across different industries on their innovation journeys and to build innovation cultures. So for those of you um, who are new to um, this series, we also have a LinkedIn group that we would love you to join. You can uh, share your experiences and insights with each other after this call. And in the follow up communications, we'll share a link. So please, if you haven't joined, come and continue the conversation on that LinkedIn group. So for those of you who are also new to IdeaDrop, we are an end to end innovation management tool to refine, capture and also evaluate ideas. And on today's in today's workshop, we're going to kick off uh, with a presentation from Colin and Abigail at GAM, and they're going to be talking about how they have utilized communications to boost awareness of their program and to sustain engagement with their innovation program. We are then going to go on to a group exercise so that everyone on the call can have a go at evaluating some examples of how other companies have approached building out their communication strategy. And then you have a chance to think about, based on your experiences or maybe from some of the experiences shared in the presentation, what you would do to change and to build out those programs differently. And then to conclude the event, uh, we've got some frameworks and best practices we hope that you'll find useful that we've uh, developed having worked with different organisations to help you to build out your communication strategy. So um, if you have a pen, um, I'd recommend that you write down some of these key takeaways from today's session. We are firstly going to be thinking about what a communication plan entails end to end. And we're also going to be talking about why communications is so important when it comes to launching your innovation programme, but also we're going to keep coming back to this idea of sustained engagement. So how is communications going to help to ensure that your programme is front of mind for everybody who's involved in it? Um, we have a series of six pillars that we think underpin uh, really successful innovation programs and these different pillars have been covered uh, through these different webinars so uh, please if you haven't attended one of the past webinars please do go uh, listen in um, but essentially we want to ensure that every program has a purpose and an outcome we want to deliver against it then has a sponsorship and leadership buy-in to ensure that it is a program which is committed to throughout the organization and then there is a process and frameworks which underpin it and will ensure that it's embedded into the organization and its culture. Here at IdeaDrop, uh, we take clients through this 13 point innovation impact plan. And in today's webinar, our focus is on communications, which really will underpin all of these key components of your program. I'm now going to hand over to Colin and Abby. So yeah, I'm Colin Bennett. I'm head of digital distribution at GAM and I'm the innovation co-lead on the IdeaDrop platform here. And I'm joined by Abigail Barnard, who will help with the presentation as we go. So GAM Investments, we're a global asset manager. Uh, we manage quite a bit of money on behalf of um, clients' assets across investment management and private labeling business. We're around 700 employees globally, and we support over 128 investment professionals who are actively investing on behalf of our clients um, across investment management, wealth management, and private labeling solutions. So it's a global organization. In April, just like everyone else, we hit lockdown. Um, and as we did that, we decided to implement IdeaDrop. We actually accelerated the implementation, and we put that platform in place just as we went into lockdown. Um, Abby um, and myself were selected and tasked with making it a success. Um, what I'd like to bring to the table here really is that there were two people who worked in different departments. Abby was an executive assistant to the C-suite 
Um, she had um, skills in communications, promotion, project management, organization, C-suite connectors. She's a facilitator and, uh, and had a passion for innovation. I was in a different part of the business. I headed up digital distribution and I looked after comms, marketing, digital technology, process government, change management and stakeholder familiarization. And when we got together, the combination brought a lot to the table and made it a success. And the results speak for themselves. Just over a year, we had an idea action rate of around 20%, plus really strong senior and employee support for the platform. Ideation and innovation is now even more firmly embedded in our culture. And next slide, please. And you can see that in some of the headline numbers. So in just over a year live, we've had around 349 um, ideas dropped. And if you look on the right hand side there, there's nearly 19,000 um, actions on those ideas across the organization. That's people liking, engaging, and kind of using it as a social platform. So they're discussing the ideas. And out of that, we've actioned 58 of those ideas. And um, we found that the introverts and extroverts began to have equal say, and we had no more same old faces again, coming up with the same old ideas. So it was really great and fresh. Next slide, please. So implementation, right? We, we needed to create engaging moments to build credibility. As I mentioned, we accelerated the implementation due to COVID and we brought it forward three months, but that extra um, sort of momentum really helped us get fast decisions and local strong leadership got things done. We moved at pace, pace and it kept that momentum high. To get everything ready, we created a Gambassador network across the business and Abby will talk about that a little bit later. But we've got really strong processes for our pipeline, our innovation pipeline, and we embedded it into business as usual activity. So it became part of the mix. We really wanted a positive energy and we created things like a countdown campaign to build awareness. And really importantly, we actually started and launched with a number of things. And one of them was something called Instagram, where you could share light moments or as in social media, you know, you could put things onto this platform. And it was around wellness as well. So people could share, you know, at a point of high stress when we were actually all working from home at COVID, we could use this platform actually to get people familiarized with the platform, look at things like the instruction set that we put on there, the guidance of how to raise idea, the guidance of how to um, be innovative, if you can guide it. But it was all there. It got people familiar with it and it seeded the, then the next stage, which was then to give us their ideas, which was fantastic. And it worked. We had professional and strong um, supporting assets. We, we had no printouts because of um, agile working, but we used videos and imagery a lot to really make it look professional, look like we really cared. And it was an important thing that we were doing. And obviously it all worked on the mobile app so people could access it any time, any place. Our communication methods were primarily around the intranet. It's a trusted method of communication within the organization, but we brought each challenge in Idea Drop Alive by having it almost like a marketing campaign. We actually had calls to action. We broadcast live to all the um, GAM staff. We de delivered emails direct to their mailbox. And we always, like a campaign, had strong follow-up. We looked at data and we had the comms plan to back it up. So we made sure it worked. And with all good things, if the CEO supports it as well, you get traction. And our CEO gave us and three founding challenges, which really did kickstart and spark the action. And our senior leadership team have been thoroughly engaged in, in everything that they've, they've done on the platform, which has been great, which has built credibility, given us solid foundations. It's made all our responses quite agile, so we've kept up with the challenges at hand. It's given us strong governance and really made strong governance and strong communication at the heart of what we do. Next slide, please. So, the Gambassadors, who are they? Um, and more importantly, where are they? So our Gambassadors are full representation across all 14 locations, at all levels of seniority, across different departments. Um, how did we get them involved? We actually approached uh, different senior members of staff across the company, asking them to put forward colleagues who would benefit from more exposure, um, who wanted to potentially build more relationships across the business, or just had a passion for either GAM or innovation. Um, so what do the ambassadors do? What is their role? So the ambassadors meet weekly at what we call our idea committee. Um, at the idea committee we review the pipeline we discuss ideas um, the agenda is data driven um, we use reports engagement monitoring highlighting ideas that have really resonated 
um, and we push ideas along the platform. So another thing that Idea Committee has been really helpful for is it acts as a major communication forum that facil facilitates change. So it could be simple things like quick wins. They're identified and then we can action them without bureaucracy. Um, other ideas um, like bigger ideas that we think may have some legs. We actually use the idea committee and then we change into an innovation session, inviting other people, people who have um, commented on the idea, um, people, stakeholders, and then we hold that innovation session, we have a, a big old chat about it and then we see if it's got any legs. Um, one other key thing is existing projects underway. Because of the broad range of people um, who are on the idea committee and their ambassadors, we are able to often see that actually this idea is already being done in this location by these people. And then we can um, communicate that to the wider organization. So it's a really big communication key, key aspect. Now, obviously being a ambassador, it is uh, voluntary. It, it, it goes alongside people's day jobs. So we really appreciate that. And we really appreciate the time they spend on the platform liking and, and fleshing out ideas. We then wanted to give something back to them. So we actually did a Meet Your Ambassador internet story that went straight to everybody um, globally, their inboxes. So they just got some exposure there, which we thought was really important to give back to them. They're giving so much on the platform. Could I go to the next slide, please? So I just very quickly want to talk about some really helpful factors that have been key to um, the success of Idea Drop at GAM. So um, mainly it has to be the senior leadership buy-in. This has been instrumental in the success. They have been fantastic. They have gone on, they have um, interacted with people's ideas. They've approached us to raise challenges themselves. So that has been hugely positively impacting. Um, we also have standing agendas at governance committees. Um, this ensures that ideas are getting pushed through to the correct place and they're being reviewed and people are kind of aware of what people are talking about if they don't check the uh, platform every day. Um, idea progress and updates we often do at global town halls, um, senior leadership team meetings, departmental meetings, committees, etc. Um, this is just to keep the buzz going. It reminds people that idea drops there. It gets people talking about it, talking about ideas. Um, we encourage people at these meetings to fully utilize the platform. Um, and from that, we often manage to get some authentic challenges. So when we're a part of it, giving an update, listening in on these meetings we kind of find authentic challenges that we can then roll out which is really really helpful um, obviously naturally idea drop provides a sample for ideation to get ideas out there be it named or cloaked sometimes these ideas wouldn't be discussed because people didn't have the um, they didn't want to put it out there so that we've got that ability um, anonymization has been a godsend I have to say so it's helped to surface the most innovative and challenging ideas, again, that people may not have want to put their name to. Um, so that's been really helpful. One thing that we've uh, realized actually uh, is that the uncloaking has um, kind of been, it, it was really encouraged. So once ideas get a little bit of traction, or if again, the senior leadership team comment, we notice people uncloaking. So it's really building confidence amongst the, uh, the staff, which is, which is fantastic to see. Um, and finally, I have to say the relentless energy from the ambassadors, from myself and Colin, I think people probably maybe even get a bit sick of us, um, but people are really enjoying it. And it's embedding an innovative culture into our organization, which is amazing to see. The changes have been fantastic. Um, so next slide, please. Thanks, Abby. So four key adoption challenges. We thought we'd we're, we're, we're condense them down for you, and hopefully this is useful based on the experience that we had over the last year. So the main things we thought that the human things, you know, those were the things that we really had to get right. So we've got four for you. So what was number one? It was the idea platform credibility. What's the point? Nothing will get done anyway. We've done this before. We've all been there. There's been the spreadsheet that had the ideas on. There's the mailbox that someone sends their ideas in. They didn't really work because they didn't have the platform. But we had the platform and it's a social platform. So you can engage. We made sure that we communicated progress and wins regularly. 
an idea is practically nothing if it hasn't got execution, delivery and action against it. So we made it really action based and we made sure people know it. So if it was action, we fed back, we respected everyone's ideas, we gave every idea and the, the, the due diligence it needed and the process it needed and we followed through with all of those. And it was best of all recorded on the platform for transparency so everyone could find out whether it was credible or not, what had been actioned or not, and that really worked. Number two, too many ideas. Is everything really an idea? Well, doesn't matter, does it? Thousands of ideas you can have, but there might be one that might be that gold dust that you've really been looking for, right? You should encourage ideas, get that culture going. It does not matter. But do be careful to dedupe, triage and ensure that you're on top of the ideas to make sure that it's not just the initial tsunami that comes out. It's actually something that's structured that can be used and can be actioned. We found that our initial idea tsunami, which there was one, it was a huge crest, actually gave way to much more thoughtful structure. And that really helped because people got used to it. And then the, the true innovation started coming through. Number three, who thought of this first? Hey, that was my idea. Ideas clash with existing projects. This always happens, right? That's my idea. It's not really right that it's that case because the, 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 we found that 90% of ideas overlapped other initiatives or already were being talked about anyway. So people saying it was their idea, not that they did, but if they thought that, ownership wasn't really about that. It was actually about incentivizing people for action to get stuff done, to move innovation forward and move it um, to an area where it can be executed. We carefully identified project overlaps and looked through with stakeholders, their involvement, what the idea was, and we altered project scopes that were already underway to actually include some of these ideas if they were slightly different to the ideas already in progress within those reports, within those projects, sorry. So you, you can see ownership was really more about getting action rather than shifting the focus from ownership to action. And lastly, number four was rewards and recognition for idea. You know, the, can I be paid? Um, can I have a percentage of the, of the savings that get made and all those type of things? Well, in an ideal world, yes, but it's not always practical. So we openly discussed this with the ambassadors and the, the consensus was actually innovation is a core competency of the role and it's part of the job. People were happy with that. It, they were pleased with doing that sort of thing. And the reward, reward and recognition comes due to the exposure to senior leadership, visibility, career progression. And importantly, we included it within our um, performance measurement and management personal objectives that at the, um, throughout the year and at the end of the year, if you participated well, you would get the appropriate reward and recognition too as part of your annual review. Next slide, please. So lastly, the business impact using idea drop, you know, innovation at GAMP now has a platform. It has a home. It can come from anywhere. It crosses silos and it's actively diverse, inclusive and transparent across the company. By working on ideas, we share common issues and it brings this global company closer together. It identified common themes and solved difficult problems efficiently by crowdsourcing the best solutions without bias. Anyone could um, input into those ideas. It helps align both strategic and tactical goals, and it facilitated useful in innovation. Abby touched on that it built in a, uh, individuals' innovation confidence, where they weren't confident before around raising ideas and maybe change and innovation. They felt comfortable doing that now. They had a platform to do it, and they knew they were supported. And it got um, we firmly embedded innovation into our culture. And by engaging and sharing these ideas, people were more connected and communicating with senior leadership teams, including our CEO you could engage directly on the platform. It was great. Inclusive, inclusivity and honest, open transparency was key in silo and hierarchy busting. The platform opened that up. You could really contribute whoever and wherever you were. You had a voice. Everyone had the voice. And now at GAM, Idea Drop is now common language. It's widely accepted across the organization and is the place for raising or engaging with innovative change. So hopefully you found that useful. It's really difficult to get it all into 10 or so minutes, but we're, we're now open to questions in, in the next few minutes before the workshop starts. Hi, Colin. Can you hear me? Hi, Madeline. Yep. Hi. Um, just a question. You said that the uh, CEO came up with three really good challenges um, for you, which uh, helped engagement. Uh, what were they? 
they were around our key strategic objectives. So you got me on the spot here now, but they were around growth, efficiency, and collaboration. So the CEO recorded the video because um, we were in lockdown yeah, in, 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 in his own house, in his own room, with his own cameras, um, recorded the challenges, posted them to us, we put them onto the platform, and then the ideas came through. So what was really good is it aligned with the strategic um, uh, goals of the organization and got people talking and thinking and activating the, the strategy. Thank you very much. And if no one else is putting up their hand, I'm going to ask you another one, which is, do you think that you would have been so successful if you hadn't had the lockdown incentive? Because actually, in this particular instance, I think um, lockdown, it seems to have helped you rather than hindered. I think that's spot on. I think it really has helped because by moving on onto the online platform and the whole shift to digital, um, people began knowing this was a channel that they can communicate and it helped them. Um, it was helpful. It was not a hindrance. You know, people generally thought that they could actually contribute um, positively by using this platform to organizational goals and improvements. And there's a big drive again to get better. There always is. And this was a great way of unleashing that talent. Um, and, and the timing was perfect. It, it really did help. But when, when people are away, they wanted to contribute. This was the um, channel that was presented to them uh, as the way they could contribute to that innovative change. A lot of people said they felt even more connected than ever. I certainly did because I was speaking to so many people from overseas. Where you usually just bump into the people in the offices. Um, so we had that. Um, we also saw a lot of people use the social side, like Colin, um, Colin mentioned. So a lot of people were checking in on each other and we had a lot of wellness um, ideas posted. Um, out for back it, we had a huge um, walk uh, steps challenge that we used. So people, it actually really, really connected people. So I would say, yes, I'd agree with Colin. It definitely helped that we were agile working. Yeah, Which, and I'm not sure whether this is. Um, I know that we've got a workshop coming, but that's um, a really interesting topic. Is what do you think we need to do differently now that we're coming out of lockdown? And you know, kind of because I think it does require. You know, you, you've uh, you've got a, you've got the crest of the wave, but now what do we do to? Rep so we were, we were very cognizant of that that it was going to come back, um, and what that's. Um, why, why we put in our governance process uh, is in place. So for example, all our ideas and feed through to our corporate governance structure. So we have committees across, for example, talent, product, operations, you know, technology, those type of things. And we purposefully create a standing agenda item in each one of those um, fora to actually feed through the ideas once they've been through our pipeline to make sure they're fleshed out. You've got the right value, the right business um, criteria and all that sort of thing, benefits identified, and they will be um, pushed through into those committees. So there is always that flow of ideas into the, um, the lifeblood of the organization through the um, governance backbone. So we're always gonna be doing that, whether you're in the office or out of the office, because that's always gonna be taking place. And it will, it will bring that through, through the senior management engagement. I've just seen, uh, Nigel, your question as well. Um, is idea drop engagement included in annual appraisals and new staff inductions? Yes, it is. The answer is we worked with HR to make sure that it is mentioned um, and people are signed up during their induction. They are then um, passed along to myself and Colin, who then give them kind of an induction on how to use the platform. And yes, uh, Colin, do you want to elaborate on the appraisals? But yes, it is also worked into our um, PMMs. Yeah, so on the appraisals, we've um, canvassed our, um, our management teams and they will be, they, they do put them into the um, annual appraisals. So, you know, as part of innovation, you can actually add it. We have a new workday platform. You can add it as a strategic um, ob objective that you can be assessed at your mid year review or your final review. And also within workday, you can get feedback of uh, your contributions. So, you know, Abby and I will be purposefully feeding back to people that they've been great contributors to the platform. I've also seen one, one question here from Mr. Chakravorty. Generally, we see top management and their subordinates get confined only on ideas that spawned by them, how this change can be achieved. 
So I'm assuming that touches on the point we were talking about. It, it crosses hierarchies and silos, that anyone can now um, talk about this. And by having the crowd, if you like, um, see which ideas resonate and the ones that actually get the most momentum, it crosses through hierarchy. So it doesn't matter if an idea is good, it will be recognized. And let's say, for example, if there was a traditional stack where a, a, a middle manager was blocking ideas or a senior manager was blocking ideas, that's now broken because you can actually raise an idea to anyone within the organization and the stakeholders in that process, for example, or that business model or that idea will all have an input and they'll make that idea resonate. And we ensure that our senior leadership team is at that kind of top of the tree, that that full board, if you like, will actually have an overview of those ideas. So one person can't hold one thing back. So it's really democratized innovation within the organization. Thank you so much, Colin and Abby, for all the insights that you shared in the presentation and for everybody that shared ideas. If you uh, do have any other questions, please just drop them in the chat and um, we'll answer them at the end. Um, but we're now going to move on to the, the workshop section. So I'll just move a few, a few slides here. Um, I think this quote here that we found, we find, we found really sort of summarizes the opportunity for communications in its simplicity. And it really speaks to what was uh, discussed in the presentation of really bringing people together and making sure that we're all moving together in what the change looks like. Change is difficult, change is hard, but we feel like communication really helps along that journey. So we are now going to start the workshop. So shortly um, through the power of technology, you will be put into smaller groups. And in these groups, um, you will uh, go through some example case studies of how other companies have approached their communications. And it's an opportunity to discuss how effective you think these communications are, um, what you currently think their state of employee engagement is, and your, your ideas on how to improve it. Uh, we have uh, 20 minutes for this exercise and then we'll come together and share our learnings and insights across our groups. Brilliant. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed your breakout rooms and had some really interesting discussions. We are now going to go to each group and hear some of your ideas. So if uh, group one, if someone from your team could go first. Um, I'll volunteer myself in group one. Um, I'll tell the hands up. We went slightly off piece and didn't really discuss as much of the, the workshop itself as, as, as we could have possibly could have done. But I think some really important takeaways uh, that we took were um, about categorizing communications as sort of information or action. So um, is a piece of communication that goes out, is it meant to be informative, so you read it and, and learn and engage with that piece of information, or is it, does it end with a call to action that you can then take away and, and, and go further? Um, the other really important thing I think we were discussing was, we were lucky enough to have Abby from GAM in our group, and she was talking about how videos are so, so important. If you've got 100 emails in your inbox, only one of them has a really nice engaging video from the CEO, you're obviously going to watch that. And so I think it's about understanding uh, what is going to get people excited and what gets people uh, engaged. Um, and I think those are two key points we took from our group. Great, thank you. Um, and group two. Yeah, perfect. I can again give a bit of a summary. Um, I think it was it was really yeah we really covered a lot of bases and and we're trying to sort of ascertain exactly what type of holistic communications and program and sort of strategy do you need to employ to really get directly to the people um, and, and communicate them and, and communicate with each individual in, in a meaningful way. Um, and I think what we found was that, you know, in the case study, you have a portal that only 150 out of a thousand employees have sort of accessed and, and viewed a very low uptake and, and obviously a lot of effort going into something which isn't really being seen. So we were sort of discussing the dynamics of creating you know, something which which focused on it being embedded, you know, being close to people's lives, work and, and business operations and it being informed by people and inclusive of the people, often using sort of focus groups and um, potentially using a tool such as idea drop to capture ideas around how to, you know, how to to to, imp to implement it. Um, sponsorship is key, whether that be senior sponsorship 
um, from each department or, or, or different departments or, or um, a, a cross pollination of departments such as in the ambassadors. Um, channels, understanding which channels work for which people, um, and, and also sort of varying the mediums that you use from sort of posters in the hallway. And um, when, when we go back to sort of, you know, working, working in the office, right through to sort of, you know, little reminders uh, in calendars and, and, and in emails, which remain, uh, despite the noise that the case study details remain important communication channels as well. Um, sessions to inspire, reward and recognition, um, and also sort of giving the license to, to innovate um, was also key themes in our discussion. Um, but at its heart, sort of building a culture of communication, I think is key. You know, the, the, there's only so much technology that you can implement. Um, there needs to be a culture of transparency, of, of trust um, and communication where um, people feel like they can communicate and communicate with, with meaning um, and, and with transparency in a way that sort of gets, gets to the nitty gritty even if it is difficult to communicate sometimes and then work from that to sort of progress and, uh, and transformative change. Brilliant. Um, and then finally, group three. I can go. Um, yeah, so I think some of the things have already been covered, but I think one of the, some of the key points that we touched on were um, setting expectations for uh, the platform. So if you're moving to portal, what are you expecting from people? How much communication and what activities are they expected to do there? And then also giving them a why, you know, why should they be on there? You know, for example, uh, one thing the portal could give or other kind of uh, transparent communication systems can give is that it's exposure. So if you're somebody who's, uh, you know, driven, who's always giving ideas, then it gives you an opportunity to be seen, to be rewarded and recognised. Um, on the platform so giving them a why and then you know it adds an element of you know fear of missing out if if the communications portal is a central aspect of communications then you get a bit of a a feedback cycle where you know people think and that's where everything's being said so everyone goes there and that's where everything everyone's being every, everything's being said um so i think there uh you know maybe, maybe two kind of uh, different uh, outcomes i think from that Great, thank you. Well, thank you for everybody for participating in your um, different groups. We are now going to finish with some of our frameworks that we hope will help you to develop out your own internal communication strategies. And we'll share these resources so you have them um, after and some of our templates as well. Um, essentially, we feel like these are the core, core pillars of your innovation uh, strategy for, for communication. So firstly, the, the purpose, and this will change based on um, sort of where you are in your journey. So it may be if you're starting off, you want to inspire your employees. And once you've got their attention, you can move on to educating them. And then ultimately, it's taking on, on taking them on a journey. So they then become advocates, and they feel empowered to pass on that message to others. Um, audience, we've spoken about this in our groups, I'm sure, the importance of segmentation and really thinking about why and what is going to be most relevant to um, different teams or different particular areas of the business. And then content. So content is king. So, you know, uh, telling stories of successes that uh, maybe innovations which have happened in the organization so far that we can celebrate, telling the stories of people who've been innovative um, through your ideation program as well. And then also some of the best practices that you can pull from industry as well to kind of guide people and inspire them to kind of break out of BAU thinking channels so uh, we recommend a multi-channel approach so really tapping into um, all the different um, opportunities you have to get um, into kind of people's um, radar so whether that's uh, meetings as well as you know uh, teams and kind of having those uh, conversations as well as um, videos and things as well all of those are really helpful to kind of nudge people um, and to remind them and to kind of create that cultural change and then measurement is key. So we're kind of testing things, seeing what sticks, whether it's different channels, different messaging, the measurement piece will be really effective for you to understand what works and what doesn't when it comes to sustaining engagement. So um, we also uh, think about 
when we're helping clients to build out their comm story, we really think about what's the story and the narrative behind it. And so really thinking about when we talk about innovation, what does that mean to your organization? And what is the kind of vision we want to take our employees on? And then along that journey, what are we going to share with them? And what are the challenges that we might experience or they might experience as we take them through that change? And then also really thinking about the call to arms. So what is it that we want them to do? Is that a shift in behavior that we are looking to track against as we go through this journey together? So um, we've spoken about the opportunity with everyone working remotely for, for video. And I'd really encourage you to think about how, if you're not already, you can include this in your communication strategy as ways of making uh, content more digestible and engaging as well. So um, when it comes to audience, there's lots of different ways that you can slice your audience particularly when it comes to thinking about um, who you're targeting in your organization and how are we going to inspire them to want to participate. So really feeding into that what's in it for them. And ultimately, this will, this will sort of be representative in the sort of messaging that we decide to use. And also, I think a key audience here is the role of champions. So the ambassadors and really thinking about how we can identify them and how we can uh, use them to help us to tap into these audiences, but also our disengaged audiences as well. Um, from a channel standpoint, these are a few um, ideas of different channels that you could use. Um, but also, I think it really comes down to with every channel thinking about um, what is the objective for that channel and that may be different, dependent on if it's an in person meeting um, or an email and then also thinking about how you're going to measure if that was successful. And we spoke in our focus group about the opportunity of uh, surveys as well. So really kind of having a mixture of qualitative and quantitative data to really understand um, what employees want to engage with. From um, a timeline standpoint, um, it's really uh, crucial to plan backwards from when you sort of want to launch your innovation program. And we recommend thinking about some sort of teasers um, to really get people excited and kind of looking forward to what's coming and then taking them through that journey. So when we do go live, throughout that week, what are the few comms that we can send um, to sort of keep people up to date with what's happening, to celebrate some initial engagement. And really, as we go through that journey, how in a month's time do we celebrate the impact of what's been achieved? And this sort of is continuous. So it's just always making sure that there's um, a few comms going out. So people are always uh, familiar with, with kind of what's happening when it comes to the programme. Um, so we've spoken about evaluation and I think really to kind of remind people about the, the importance of this and often I've, I find that clients sometimes worry about all the different metrics that they could track and sort of where to start and I think that what we've learned is sort of to kind of start with the basics and try things and just kind of see firstly if people open things and then once they do that we can then support them to think about okay out of all the content which which are people clicking on most and kind of what messaging do we change but sometimes changing one thing at a time will, get, will give us greater insights um, but do contact us if you want some advice around evaluations because we've tried and tested a few different approaches now um, which have helped us I think to gather some useful some useful insights um, so that is everything from today's session um, I really hope that you um, enjoyed it and found it very valuable um, it's great to see that we've got so many different um, clients and we've got also representative from across the world so I think it's been really interesting to kind of share learnings and also there's probably I'm hoping um, a bit of um, familiarity with some of the challenges that we're all experiencing as well. Um, please do carry on the conversation on our LinkedIn group and uh, we do have our next um, webinar coming up which is all around that measurement piece um, on the 25th of August so we'll send you the link to sign up um, and please, we'll hopefully see a lot of you there. Um, we'll take any final questions. I think a question from Tim. 
Uh, so for the end of the first segment, I think it's directed at GAM. Uh, mm -hmm. Colin, uh, you talked about this process embedding innovation in the culture of GAM. Did this process reveal any other organizational values that surprised GAM leadership? Something they didn't know about their existing team, either a strength to develop or a gap uh, to go and hire new contributors? Good question. Um, off the top of my head, one of the big strengths that we found was the huge depth of talent that we had within the organization that was not untapped, but because it was utilized in its normal way. But we crowdsourced an incredible amount of um, activity and work and action and contribution to things in ways that um, we wouldn't have done without idea drop. So I think in answer to your question, that, that's, that's the first thing. Um, I don't think we've brought in anyone, but it has precipitated a few things. So one of the, the first jobs that we did with the, the tsunami of ideas that I mentioned was that we had so many that Abby and I um, split those into themes. And those themes covered a number of things from wellness to talent management, to technology, to product, to all those sort of things. And they have um, influenced over the last year, the formation of those um, departments, for example, or, or functions. And, you know, not that we directly attribute those to, you know, new hires, et cetera, but I think by raising these things and making them transparent and everyone knows that they're things that need to be addressed, the departments and the functions need to act on those things. So, you know, it does precipitate change um, and that could lead to hires. It could lead to change in process. It could lead to different models of engagement, all sorts of things. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Um, and I think another one from Madeline. Um, so most firms I've worked for, if not all, have been really hesitant uh, to broadcast their failures. But being comfortable with failure is a key element of, of a successful innovation culture. Any ideas on getting senior leadership more comfortable with exposing failures? So Colin, if you want to kick us off, but anyone else is also welcome to answer. I, I can do, but I mean, it's, you know, failure is part of success, isn't it? It, 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 it is a necessary part of that journey. Um, I, I hear where you're coming from, Madeline, in, in terms of, you know, traditionally, um, senior management do not like to admit failure, but if it's part of the culture, and failure is risk managed so that we understand the risks around the changes that we're making, then failure is a necessary part of continuous improvement. So I think, you know, it's a bit of a sort of a long answer, but, you know, I think if it's in the culture and the new type of management that's needed for the, you know, the VUCA world that's ahead of us, things moving at fast pace and, you know, a lot of digital and a lot more sustainable, you'll need to be, you know, very risk based on your decisions going forward. And therefore, you're going to need to have to embrace those types of failures to ensure that you fail fast, but not at high risk to your client's outcomes. And then I think leadership will be happy, happy to, to embrace that. Yeah. I think just to add to that, actually, it's really interesting. I think the feeling fast, the concept of failures seems wrong, but I think things fail all the time, but they get brushed under the carpet. So people don't want to admit failure, so they don't show it. So therefore it happens and you just don't know about it. So actually, if you create a culture where testing and trialing and failing is acceptable, then they can kind of see where the mistakes are made. And, and actually senior leaders should have much more um, uh, insight into it. And actually then those same mistakes don't get made again because people can go, actually, let's learn from the mistakes. And it's really hard, but I think once people start to see it, it becomes much easier to drive into a culture because actually it's, they're better off than they were by pretending they were scared of failure, not trying anything. So I think those things happen anyway, they just don't see them. Um, so visibility for me is a, is a big thing. And I've seen people shift and organizations shift because of it. Mm. I'd, I'd also say communication in that decision-making process. And, and again, in that sort of that risk management, I really like that, Colin, sort of, you know, having a transparent and, and communicative culture where decision making is is led by discussion from you know people with a with a cross sort of section of experiences also means that those sort of those measured risk managed uh, you know failures or all the the sort of decisions to 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 get to that failure is one that's shared and one that's been worked through and one that can be learned from from numerous people so again i think the way that decision making and 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 sort of 
uh, the consequence of decision making is communicated is also essential as well. Absolutely. Uh, any further questions? Is the I see there's one about smaller um, uh, organisations and how they can um, utilise making ideas a success. Um, I could quickly just say we use it on small teams as well as across our whole organisation. So, for example, with an idea drop, we can have a small team and you can just create it. So I work with a team of 10 people. We've got idea drop working there for challenges and um, ideation, innovation, etc., it can be small or it can be across the whole organization, 500 people to so 700 people for us. Um, and we're already talking with idea drop about open innovation. So that's everything outside. So it's perfectly scalable from, you know, two people talking um, to um, everyone. Yeah. And I think what I'd add as well is that, although, you, you know, it might be a small group, the things you're dealing with, all the topics that you're discussing, them, there may be many. Um, you know, a, a you know, 10 person investment team will be discussing the same number of topics, same number of investment opportunities as a, you know, a, a hundred person investment team. So although the team is small, the content that you need to tackle is, is you know, just as big and requires just the same, uh, you know, amount of you know, uh, facilitation and organisation. Yeah. Well, th thank you, everybody. If you do have any other further questions, um, please share them in the LinkedIn group. And yeah, just thank you again to Colin and Abby for your presentation and to everybody who joined and for your participation um, in, in the session today.